Hello, I'm Leslie McVean. Heroin and opioid use are rising around the country and in Maine. Here in Portland, it has been rising at an alarming rate. In one 24-hour period recently, we had 14 overdoses. Um, it's believed that the addicts are turning to heroin in as a replacement for oxycodone. Um, as part of the city's outreach and education campaign, CTN is conducting a series of interviews with city officials. And today, I have with me Toho Sama, yes. who's the acting director of public health Correct. here in Portland, and Chris Corson, who I'll let you tell, <laughs> tell us your title. Your so, coordinator of substance abuse services for the city of Portland. Right. Thank you for being here. Um, why don't we begin by talking about an overview of what, what the problem is and some of the statistics involved in explaining where we got here and, and what we're doing. Do you want me to start? Sure. Sure. So uh, certainly, like you alluded to, you know, a lot of this issue around the explosion in heroin use locally can be tied to the increased prescription um, drug abuse around painkillers, which we did, the state did a great job in uh, stemming that issue in terms of implementing what's, you know, or publicizing what's called the PMP or the Prescription Monitoring Program. So that's a service where uh, providers can look up a patient's name and see where, you know, what other uh, prescriptions they're receiving from other providers, because a lot of people were kind of doctor shopping. Um, and, and getting prescriptions from, from different multiple, people exactly. for different reasons. Right, and so we did a great job of curbing that that um, issue, but of course we didn't really, uh, you know, the consequence of that is then people are still um, f having the addiction issues, and so they're turning to the street drugs that give off the same effect, so in this case heroin. And so I think that's a lot of it, uh, what's happening. So. Um, you know, we've seen, I believe, the, the deaths uh, related to heroin have quadrupled in the past few years. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's only deaths. You know, that's the, unfortunately the ultimate end and conclusion of health outcomes. But certainly we're seeing a lot of morbidity and rise in, you know, overdoses, like you said, over that 24-hour period. And so um, it is kind of, uh, uh, like you said, exploded recently. Right. And it's a, it's a, it's a matter of economics, mm -hmm. supply and demand, and we're seeing dealers from New York who are coming up here mm -hmm. and making a lot more money than they could right in the city. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and, and what maybe what you've seen? Well, I think there, there is a demand as far as um, some of the issues that Toa were talking about is mm -hmm. that as a, as a population and as folks um, who you don't, would never see as someone as what someone might say is the typical addict is someone who uh, might have been hurt on the job, might have had a, an automobile accident, and have been exposed to prescription medications or more so harder drugs that we're talking about, oxycodone or oxycodone. And um, for legitimate reasons, they're seeking pain relief. And through the different programs, which, which were good, um, sometimes maybe there wasn't enough education or whatnot of how they affect the body, how they affect the mind, how they affect people craving for these the medications just to feel better. Yeah. Um, so I just want to add that that's a real important piece that um, for legitimate reasons people were prescribed these medications right. and now we're seeing some of the aftermath with that right. and uh, people wanting to have pain relief and or that have become addicted for these medications. Um, there, there's a pool of people that will have that. And that, um, that feeds into the fact that it's not all young people it's all ages. Mm -hmm. um, my, I, I know I recently had a knee replacement, mm -hmm. and I was given a, an opiate sure. drug for that, and I was afraid to take it mm -hmm. um, and tried not to, which was a mistake. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. um, that that does happen very innocently to people. Yes. Yeah. What is the city doing to inform the community about this problem and what they can do to seek help? if they need it. Sure, I'll say a big piece of what uh, you were talking about mm -hmm. and what we at the City of Portland have talked about for a while is that it is all ages, it is all genders, it is all class of people. Um, so that's a big part that I'm glad that you're talking about is that it, it hits every group of people, um, including 
you know, young mothers who are who are pregnant and then now are bringing children into the into the world that are opioid addicted. So that's a big part of the of the conversation that we want to have is that um, it's everyone. It's from the unborn to the born to the 20, 30, 40, 50, and 60 year olds that are up. Um, so one of our efforts is around trying to get those medications out of the cabinets, as you were talking about, from anywhere. I mean, I think a part of the of the segment we don't kind of see is from even our local dentist that that prescribe us medications sometimes um, for that reason to, to reduce pain and discomfort but we're trying as a campaign and we put on our website uh, over at the city of Portland exactly where to go all through Cumberland County to dispose of those medications so that's that's one thing that we're very serious about and uh, really putting in a good effort to try to get those medications out of the house uh, and then all to the proper disposal spites through Cumberland County so they're not diverted and sold for other things so young children don't get in there. So that's, that's one of the initiatives that we're doing around their prescription drug as far as just the reduction of it on the streets. And I know that the White House recently um, dedicated $5 mm -hmm. million dollars to this. I think it's $5 million. It's about two and a half, maybe half oh. that, but yeah. Okay, plenty. Well, a lot of money. A lot of money, to, yes. To 15 target states. Correct. Maine is one of those yes. states. And it's going to be used to, to not, um, you know, immediately criminalize mm -hmm. people who are victims of this, but to help in other ways. How, how do you see the state using that money? Sure, so I'm not uh, aware of the particular details on how it'll be you know, mm -hmm. um, funneled down to each state and how much right. we'll, we could get locally, mm -hmm. but certainly what I really appreciate about the effort is that they're looking at a public health approach and a law enforcement approach and kind of covering the whole spectrum, which I think is great you know, because we can't arrest our way out of this problem. It's certainly, a, um, like I said, a spectrum of services that are needed, so right. the stuff that Chris and his staff does around prevention, education, and then continuing on the treatment, and then also the law enforcement side as well. So um, I would, you know, you know, we have a great relationship with um, the main CDC and the substance use mental health um, program up at the state, and so, you know, however they see fit to spend, you know, the public health dollars at least, we would love to partner with yeah. them. It's a real <coughs> holistic approach it is. Mm -hmm. to dealing with mm -hmm. the problem, right. which isn't going to go away overnight. Exactly. Um, what about these dealers who are coming from New York? Um, of, of the people who've been arrested, 17% are from out of state. Mm. How, how do we keep them from coming in? Um, <laughs> I, I mean, that's, you know, that's really right. scary. Um, it's, how, what's happening there? Do you know or is that more law enforcement dealing with that issue? I would say it's more law enforcement dealing with that issue and certainly I know you're going to interview Chief yes. Soschuk and yes. we partner with them a lot on whether it's the needle exchange or the educational um, um, outreach we do. Uh -huh. um, we partner with the police a lot but I, I'll, I'll let him answer that right. because I don't, you know, he has his own strategies around that. Well, I know there are families who are concerned maybe about loved ones. Mm -hmm. um, where, where can they go? How can they reach out to somebody to help mm -hmm. them? I think that that's a big part of the, the last question you just asked and uh -huh. the current one is that when you have a, any city, I mean, Portland isn't, and you'll hear from other people, isn't any different than a lot of the cities in the Northeast Corridor that's dealing with this issue. Um, other cities and other counties have been very creative as far as accessing treatment to people. Uh, different communities like Gloucester, Mass has a program where you can walk in with, with your drugs, with your paraphernalia, mm -hmm. and just say, I need help. And instead of arresting you, they say, have a seat, someone will be right out. Right. Um, and this came out just last week that they have enrolled 109 people and 109 people were all served, no one was turned away. Right. So I think a real big part of, of looking at both things is really getting the community involved, parents involved, as, as certain parents have been very loud, and I'm glad they're loud about um, what's out there, that um, Toho, nor myself, nor the police department um, can do it alone, and, you, and, and everyone knows that it has to be a community effort saying we need more treatment, because sometimes it's, it's easy to say there's a lot of treatment available, um, but unless you fit a certain criteria, you, you won't have access to treatment. And then those kind of vulnerable folks will always be left to kind of be preyed upon from people uh, mm -hmm. from out of state. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's just so scary. I mean, heroin is just, there's no, you can't do it on your own. Mm -hmm. You really right. can't. 
it's, right. you need help. You need help, you need support, and I would say, you know, in addition to that, um, you know, some people may say it doesn't really affect me personally, you know, I don't know anyone in my family, but um, certainly if, if we might see an increase in drug-related crimes and break-ins and mm -hmm. things like that, it may eventually um, affect you. It, it affects all of right. us. Now, I, um, we have some information about where people can call or, or a website. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to just say it sure, briefly sure. and we will also put a graphic? Sure. So uh, any kind of information around resources, around mm -hmm. uh, what's out there for treatment, if folks are interested in the new uh, Narcan law that comes out that gives people um, the opportunity to purchase Narcan through getting a prescription from their doctor, things of that nature about the law, who could use it, who, who can't. Um, OverdosePreventionProject.org, uh, there's information there about right. what the city's doing, uh, resources people could print out. Um, so that's a great website we encourage people to, to look at. Thank you. Thank you both for being here. Thank you for having Thank us. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today as we continue our conversation about the alarming rise in the use of heroin in Maine and in particular in the greater Portland area. Joining me today are Portland Chief of Police, Michael Soschuk. Good morning. Good morning. And Fire Chief Jerry Lamoya. Good morning. How are you both? Wonderful. Doing great. Thanks for having us. You're well you're welcome. Um, the the your departments are integral in helping to stop and eventually prevent the use of heroin in this area. Mm -hmm. I'm going to begin with you, um, Chief Lamoya. Mm -hmm. um, your department oversees the paramedics, and they're the ones that get called out when there's an overdose. Could you tell us a little bit about it from their perspective? Sure. Um, you're absolutely right when, uh, when dealing with uh, substance abuse, the Portland Fire Department's on the front line of that, um, that effort and, uh, you know, the response to that, and we deal with the aftermath. And a very, very high number of our emergency medical service calls for service have some aspect of substance abuse attached to that, whether that is the uh, heroin overdose or, or substance abuse such as alcoholism. Uh, we, we deal with that. Uh, on a daily basis, and it is a very large part of our um, response and our workload. Yeah, and um, how it's treated now? There's Narcon. Is that Narcan? Some, yes. Narcan, yeah. excuse me. Pardon. Is that something that is used? It, it, are all your yes. paramedics carrying that? Uh, not only our paramedics, but uh, every single one of our uh, EMS care providers, mm -hmm. uh, basic EMTs. All, all the way up to paramedics are trained in the use of, uh, of that as a drug as a tool for us. And the city of Portland administers, uh, the administration of that has grown exponentially um, over the last couple of years. Uh, we've seen a, a, a very l large increase in, in the use of that. Uh, and that has provided the ability to save lives in the moment uh, but it does not necessarily um, provide a solution for the real problem of substance abuse. Right. It, it's like a little safety net just to get through that. Through that moment of time. And then what happens after well, that? Well, unfortunately, um, you know, this is one of the largest frustrations from the emergency medical services is we have very few options in regards to our, our efforts around responding to substance abuse problems. Uh, with the emergency medical services, we really have one choice, you know, treat on scene, transport to a local emergency department. Uh, as far as any long-term solutions, um, we really don't have any. Yeah. You know, we, we're responding in a reactive manner, and uh, that it is taking a, a toll on our responders and our system, and, and frankly, in the, um, the ability of the department to service all of our residents. It, it has an impact. Right, and there, there have been an alarming increase in the overdoses. Yes, there has. Um, to date this year, um, 
we've administered Narcan over 100 times. Mm -hmm. um, to compare that with 2014, mm -hmm. uh, we had 107 last year. In a whole so year. that is a dramatic, dramatic increase. Mm -hmm. um, that alone does not tell the whole story of substance abuse and uh, heroin addiction. It, it's only part of the story. You know, we're responding. Many times we respond to overdoses where that where Narcan is not administered. Mm -hmm. You know, we administer that. We use that drug as a tool, that medication as a tool. Mm -hmm. When someone presents us with an overdose where their breathing is to a point where imminent death is coming. Right. And we utilize that to bring back spontaneous respirations. Mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes we'll, we will be at an overdose call where that isn't, that isn't at that point yet and it's not administered. So our actual numbers of, of actual substance abuse calls and drug overdoses is much higher. Oh. And that brings me to you, Chief Sustrak. Sure. Um, uh, why? Where the supply and demand? We, we're mm -hmm. having, we're seeing more and more heroin here. Dealers are coming up from New York. Um, tell us a little bit about what your department is seeing in this rapid change. Sure. I think uh, the heroin use is really an epidemic from a national perspective, uh -huh. and uh, it's certainly happening right here in our own backyard, without question. Uh, and while uh, cocaine and crack for decades were really kind of the number one drug of choice in southern Maine as a whole, uh, we've certainly seen uh, a drastic increase in the use of heroin. And the social impacts of heroin uh, are really uh, incredibly difficult to calculate. Um, you're talking about human lives and the destruction, the path uh, that heroin takes these folks down. And it truly really is uh, traumatic for the entire community without question. What is the department doing to try to target these dealers and suppliers? Um, I mean, I can't even imagine. Sure. You know, we can't put up a wall around Maine. Right. Um, what, yeah. what are you doing? I, we have very strong partnerships uh, with other local departments. Mm -hmm. uh, we have strong partnerships with Maine Drug Enforcement, which is a state entity. Mm -hmm. And then we have strong partnerships with our federal uh, law enforcement friends as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so we work, uh, share intelligence, uh, try to really focus our attention and our limited resources on those dealers. Uh, you know, the chasing addicts around and putting people in jail that are really just trying to try not to get drug sick is what they're trying to do day to day. Right. Um, it's not what we're focused That's on. That's not the we, answer. You know, we're focused on dealers. Right. Um, but I do think you know, we would be remiss if we really didn't talk about, you know, the enforcement aspect of this, but there's also prevention, education, there's also treatment and rehabilitation, and then there's enforcement. Uh -huh. If you don't have all three of those working in concert, uh, then you will fail, and you will fail every single yeah. time. Uh, we you, know that. And you talk about education. At what level does the education start? Are they still doing um, drug and alcohol counseling in the schools? They are. Uh, we do have some questions out now about how extensive that is. Mm -hmm. Because I do think we have to get to our kids as early as possible to talk about these issues. We have to continue to educate uh, parents and families overall, mm -hmm. and then communities. You have to educate communities about you know, how big a deal this really is. Uh, and then uh, Chief Lamoria talked about you know the lack of treatment and rehabilitation options, mm -hmm. uh, and it's terrible. Uh, you know, so we pick people up; uh, they're dead on the scene. They're brought back to life. It's a miracle, it but it's a very short-term fix. Yeah. They may or may not go to the hospital, where they'll be observed for a couple hours, and then they'll yeah. be released to go back out and do it all over again. At no point in the system, as it currently stands, is there the opportunity to intervene and try to bring long-term assistance and a long-term solution, which is an awful big word when you're looking at a problem like this, uh, to individuals, you yeah. know, when they're in the middle of a crisis. Yeah. It's what you're both talking about is a more holistic approach Absolutely. to this problem where yeah. everyone, we're all working together. Mm -hmm. um, and the doctors. Now, education for the, for the prescription of, of legal drugs mm -hmm. for pain or whatever, they've got to be brought into the mix too to know when too much is too much. I don't know what the, the dialogue is there at this right. point. Well I can say that uh, the reason that heroin, one of the reasons that heroin exploded in, in our nation uh, mm -hmm. was around painkillers yeah. and obviously 
oxycodone, oxycotton, that whole family of drugs uh, were being overprescribed. They were being pushed by pharmaceutical companies, then overprescribed by doctors, uh, and then people were bringing them home, and then they would become addicted. And in many cases, people were stealing those drugs, and they would be get addicted. Uh, and it was just a terrible, slippery slope all the way around. So there's no question. I do believe that doctors are doing a better job of that, but we've yeah. got a long ways to go uh, without question. And if yeah. I could, uh, we, we regularly, prior to this point in time, we regularly saw um, substance abuse in, in just what you said, in okay. prescription medications. You know, and, and the point to make is that heroin is bad stuff. You know, it's really bad stuff, but we're still dealing with substance abuse and whether it's substance abuse through prescription pain medicine mm -hmm. or it's substance abuse with something as drastic as putting a needle in your vein, mm -hmm. you know, which is, which is really raises that bar in people's perception of the problem, but the problem's been lingering. And we, we have a, it, it's about substance abuse. Yeah. Heroin, you know, we, when we talk about that, it's a very scary thing for uh, our community because they, you know, 20 years ago, the heroin addict was someone that most people could identify as, I'll never be there. Mm -hmm. You know, that was a certain demographic that most people wouldn't, wouldn't equate themselves with. Mm -hmm. Today, we're not seeing that. We're seeing heroin being used by a demographic that spans, um, spans generations. It span, spans race, racial lines, it spans uh, economic lines, mm -hmm. and we're seeing uh, the use of heroin in communities, neighborhoods, and uh, populations that we have never seen it before. Um, and and it, what we have to really get to grips with is what leads us down this road to where someone who of reasonable mind mm -hmm. resorts to um, intravenous drug use. Yeah. And the, and the scary thing is that it's always, it's it's not always just heroin. It's laced with fentanyl. fentanyl. Yeah. Have you have you seen incidences of that? Because that's oh, deadly. It's, yeah, it's, it's deadly. Absolutely. It's it's far more potent yeah. uh, than straight heroin. Generally yeah. speaking, uh, I can tell you that uh, the main drug enforcement, our drug agents, have done recent raids where they found nothing but fentanyl. You know. There was a time when I was at the drug unit where people were cutting cocaine with baby powder, you know, there or baking soda, and they're trying to to expand uh, the amount that they have to sell. Well, now they're cutting heroin with fentanyl, or they're selling straight fentanyl as heroin. So even in an addict's mind, you're used to a certain dosage. You think you can handle a certain amount. Yeah. Uh, you've been doing it for a long time in many cases, so you're comfortable here. And then you shoot straight fentanyl, which may be 30, 40, 50% more potent, more mm -hmm. toxic than regular heroin, yeah. and it, it's killing people. And some of our viewers may open up their medicine cabinets and they've got that leftover two or three pills from their knee surgery or their hip surgery. Right. They can bring them in to a place now mm -hmm. and get rid of them. So they're not tempting some kid who's opening up the medicine cabinet or someone else who right. they don't know who's in their space. Yeah, it's actually, you know, the DEA ran a program for years, a yeah. drug take back. Um, they stopped briefly, the Sheriff's Association in the state of Maine picked it up. Right. Uh, it, the state of Maine was uh, routinely, year after year, number one per capita in the amount of drugs that we were taking back uh, yeah. in these uh, in these events. Which is a good sign. It's a good sign, but it also tells you how much is out there out in there, the medicine just cabinet. Available. Um, but yeah. it's great that people are paying attention and using yeah. this as a service. Yeah. But the Portland Police Department, the Cumberland County Jail, South Portland Police Department, people right in this region mm -hmm. uh, have uh, 24 hour boxes. You can come into the lobby of the police department and today just and just in. give it to us real time. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think, um, you know, this, the idea of all working together, it's going to affect all of us in some way. Sure. Um, you know, briefly, what can we do? And then who can people get in touch with for more information? Could you? I think that uh, really we need to focus on our, uh, our legislators, our elected officials yeah. to say this is a real deal here. We are all concerned about it. Yeah. We demand action. And we demand action on all three of those items again. Mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm an enforcement guy, that's what I do. That doesn't work all by itself. It right. just doesn't. 
Uh, I would like to see, you know, the war on drugs have failed. I would love to see a war on addiction, not on addicts, but yes. on addiction. Right. Um, and for all substances that are being abused out there uh, day to day. Beautifully and said. I, yeah, and I also think that uh, we, we do need to push elected officials to understand how the problem impacts all of our our services and the community. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it affects everyone. And uh, to for years, you know, the the drug addiction problem was pushed, you know, out of out of the out of sight, out of the mainstream, to where you know it was a certain part of town, or it was a certain you know subset of the the neighborhood. And we've got to recognize that that's no longer the case. Yeah. You know that we. We see this throughout our community, and it's a it's 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 a Portland problem. It's a Maine problem. It's a national problem, and it's uh, I agree wholeheartedly with Chief Sawchuk. Um, we've worked together uh, along with the the uh, Mayor Brennan's Substance Abuse Task Force, and to bring a lot of the issues to the forefront. Um, and and I agree wholeheartedly that it, it's really it's like this three-legged stool, you know, and. You, you absolutely, along with the enforcement of it, you have to look at the, the education and the, the treatment of it. And without those three things, you're, it's not a stable platform. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is not a problem that we can narc our, narc in our way out of, um, and we can't arrest our way out of it either. And there has to, you know, the, there has to be some other options. Well, thank you both. I think you're doing a wonderful job. And quickly, a telephone number or a website for either one of you. We'll, we'll run it as a graphic, but maybe you could say it as well. Yeah, the city of Portland has their website has an overdose prevention uh, aspect to it. Public Health is doing some nice work on there. Uh, so I would go right to the city of Portland website and uh, just look for the public health page and that'll trickle you down uh, mm -hmm. to get the proper information. That's terrific. Thank you. I feel like we're in good hands. Well, thank you, you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us.